Uh, kia ora koutou. Thanks, Sophie. Um, my name is Karen Fisher, and what I'm presenting today is uh, the synthesis of the work that's been done in the governance uh, in relation to marine governance and um, ecosystem based management, which is available in a summary document that has been prepared by the challenge. Um, I'll just present the first half of the presentation and then Linda will take over. So the research that's been undertaken in sustainable seas has identified potential for ecosystem based management to provide a way of overcoming some of the fragmentation that characterizes our um, marine governance in Aotearoa at present. And this fragmentation arises as a consequence of multiple laws and policies that regulate different kinds of activities and what can occur on land and in sea. The way in which EBM can potentially address this fragmentation is through its emphasis on connectivity, both in terms of ecological connectivity, but also recognizing the connections between people and ecosystems, it provides a way for incorporating diverse values and knowledges, which is important in the Aotearoa context because of the position of Māori's Tangata Whenua and the um, contribution of Mātauranga. And also it, the research has emphasised that by taking a place-based approach and working with people who care about particular things and have common goals at, at, at heart, then this is also another way of potentially enhancing uh, how we govern our marine spaces. So through the challenge, we have generated a number of different principles or a set of principles relating to ecosystem-based management, blue economy and te ao Māori, which guide practice. So these have come out of the research where we've identified what's important to make this shift towards improved uh, marine management. And then these can then guide practice moving forward. So the kinds of research that has been undertaken in the challenge and that we have sought to synthesize in, these summary, in the summary documents and guidance document um, has been, has looked at marine management, both in Aotearoa New Zealand, but also internationally. And based on this research, there's evidence that strongly supports that taking an EBM approach can help to coordinate some of those policy, uh, to coordinate policy objectives and enhance social and ecological outcomes, which is important for overcoming fragmentation. Similarly, the research also demonstrates that EBM may well provide a way to overcome scale mismatches, both spatial and temporal scale mismatches, because it emphasizes the need for aligning policies and outcomes across different scales with, from that, that spatial perspective. And in particular, the evidence demonstrates that there are things that we can learn from the place-based implementation of EBM that can help to support efforts to address scale mismatch. So where jurisdictions don't align with um, the ecological processes and functions in a particular location. And similarly, where there are temporal scale mismatches that are associated with say, um, the time taken for to see the benefits of recovery or restoration or some kind of management aim. And these may differ to electoral cycles, for example. So in seeking to synthesize the research that's been done, the first step that we took was to characterize the different kinds of governance arrangements that exist in Aotearoa based on what the research had looked at. So we came up with these um, three different categories or ways of understanding marine governance and distinguish statutory arrangements, which are those more formalized uh, arrangements that arise out of law and policy, non-statutory governance arrangements, and tikanga-based arrangements. So just going through each of those quickly, Statutory arrangements are those that arise out of laws and policies. So they're formal in the sense of they provide for legal rights, have clear mandates, clear roles and responsibilities for those who are charged with giving effect to those pieces of legislation. So in the marine environment or environmental governance more broadly, an obvious example that comes to mind is the Resource Management Act and the fact that there are these clear responsibilities that fall out of the Resource Management Act. These kinds of statutory arrangements are also evident in bespoke arrangements and arrangements arising out of treaty settlements. And I just have a, an, an image here of um, the area that's covered under the um, settlement for Ngati Poro, and which has been the focus for Hua Tokina or Hapu Air, which is a project that was undertaken in phase two of the challenge. So these are um, very formalized, very much focused on law. A, a different form of arrangement that has a lot of potential in enhancing ecosystem-based management are the non-statutory governance arrangements. 
So these tend to be bottom-up, place-based, uh, values-driven, and are, um, arise out of concerns that might be expressed within a community or a desire to see some kind of improvement. Concerns could be in relation to pollution, desires could be around, and visions around um, restoration efforts. These kinds of arrangements don't have a legal mandate per se, uh, but it may have a more of a social mandate coming out of communities. And there's also um, the examples of these kinds of arrangements that have been investigated through the challenge research include the Integrated Kaipara Harbour Management Group, which is a place-based iwi-led an, an entity or collaborative entity that emerged following a treaty settlement with the purpose of thinking about how to deal with the issues facing the integrated Kaipara Harbour, manage, uh, Kaipara Harbour um, or Kaipara Moana, and in particular sediment. So taking an ecosystem-based approach by looking at what was happening on land and what happens on sea, um, out in sea. And the Ohawa, Ohiwa Harbour Implementation Forum, which oversees and monitors the implementation of the Ohiwa Harbour Strategy. So these kinds of arrangements, although they don't have a legal mandate, they have the potential to influence those more formalized and statutory arrangements. So in the case of um, the Integrated Kaipara Harbour for, Group, for example, this comprises partners from Iwi Hapu as well as regional councils and district councils. And similarly, the Ohiwa Harbour Implementation Forum um, is constituted through representatives from regional and district councils as well as um, Iwi authorities. So there's that potential to inform those more formal decision-making processes. A third category that we've identified in the research is tikanga-based governance arrangements. These are in some ways similar to what we see in the non-statutory arrangements in the sense that they tend to be bottom-up, place-based and values-driven. But um, a key point of difference, I guess, is that the these Tikanga-based arrangements arise out of um, rights and responsibilities based on whakapapa that's handed down from tupuna. And um, we see evidence of the, how tikanga is articulated in these arrangements, again, through the um, Integrated Kaipara Harbour Management Group with their framework, which is very much underpinned by um, tikanga or by um, values that are expressed by the iwi, that whakapapa to that harbour. And, um, and similarly, we're seeing in uh, the legislation at present, particularly arising out of the bespoke treaty settlements, evidence of tikanga being, um, having space within formal legislation. So an example, not being legal uh, in, in the sense of the, it's not, it, yeah, there's a, an interesting broadening out of what our legislation includes. And so it is, we're seeing tikanga being co codified within legislation. So for example, the legislation arising from Te Pua, um, uh, te, te pua te Awapua, uh, sorry, uh, the Wanganui River, and um, the, the fact that the um, those responsible for making decisions on behalf of the Wanganui River are required to take into consideration the kawa, or te, te Pua Te Kawa, which is um, based in the relationships that Tangata Whenua have with the river extending across generations. I'll now hand over to Linda. Kia ora, Karen. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, nei rā te me i māna, kia koutou katoa. Um, so I'm just going to walk us through the next set of slides. And, and basically, as Karen um, noted, our research highlighted opportunities to enable the implementation of a more holistic approach to governance, um, both with exist, within existing legal and po um, policy contexts, as well as opportunities to strengthen them further um, by focusing on people and process. Essentially, during the life of the challenge, we've observed numerous governance examples um, across the broad range of projects that we've been involved in. And we've seen a diverse range of scales. And what really stood out for us was that having a system of governance that can accommodate those diverse realities, those diverse approaches tailored specifically to people in place was going to be critical to thinking about how we can achieve alignment and in, in across government more broad, uh, across governance more broadly. So instead of trying to pick winners amongst the various models we observed, we identified what appeared to be a core set of critical ingredients. 
And this is important because decisions carry uncertainty and as Karen highlighted, existing law and institutional arrangements have placed us in a position of being highly fragmented in the way that we interact with the, with the moana. <clears throat> Simply changing the model of governance won't necessarily change the behaviours needed at all levels to achieve the, the sort of change that we want to see. So the first of those ingredients is, um, if sorry, Karen, if we can just go to the next slide, thank you, um, is around empowering courageous leadership and achieving long-term vision and outcomes for our marine environment really requires steadfast and actually truly courageous leadership, um, particularly if we are thinking about a more ocean-centered um, approach to governance. The leadership of people we have seen through our research exists in many forms and in various forms um, across multiple scales, um, incorporating multiple worldviews, as Karen's highlighted. And really, we need to recognize and support leaders to ensure that decisions are and actions taken to improve ocean outcomes are effective. <clears throat> The reason I've put this image up here is um, that one of the models that uh, was developed early in the challenge and the sort of the first few years of the challenge was around a waka taurua. And it's just a point that I, I wanted to highlight because um, we common, more commonly know about waka haurua, which are the big double-hulled waka that are purpose-built for open ocean navigation. Um, waka Tauru, um is observed very early on by um, people like Elston Best, um, were actually independent single-hulled waka that were used for various things that were on occasion um, drawn together and lashed together to achieve specific purposes. And so when we think about um, our Te Reti or Waitangi Foundations, the Waka Tauru model is a really useful way of thinking about the fact that, um, of course, um, within each hull of that waka, whether the, those hulls are Crown and Māori or whether those hulls are um, Mātauranga Māori and Science or, or whatever form of, of participation we're thinking about in terms of ocean governance, um, there will be occasions where we... Um, come together to achieve specific ocean governance um, necessities, but there'll be occasions too where um, preserving the integrity of each of our approaches will become important as well. So that was really the reason I wanted to highlight that image. Next slide, please, Karen. The next critical ingredient was really around enabling enduring capacity. Having a clear vision, framework and objectives for the marine environment to achieve effective implementation requires long-term planning, commitment, knowledge and resourcing. Um, nothing particularly novel in that. Endure, uh, enabling enduring capability, though, will be critical to achieving sustainable ocean outcomes for future generations and will only be successful if the necessary capacity is in place for the long term. This means that governance arrangements must be sufficient to withstand changing short-term political and economic priorities by ensuring that authorizing that our authorizing environment is stable and supportive. It will need to address high levels of uncertainty on occasion. It will require prioritization, long-term planning, and long-term resource certainty. And um, the presentation to follow ours will um, talk more a little more about that. Next slide, please, Karen. The third critical ingredient really is ensuring inclusive capability. And the complexity of other marine environments, its multiple connections, um, values, and interests attached to those environments require diverse capabilities to ensure effective governance. We think of things like integrity, transparency, accountability, clarity, um, and innovation, they're all standard and fundamental capabilities required for good governance. Um, but there are other things that we've seen um, existing, you know, challenges in existing models around 
um, an openness to include uh, different types of knowledge um, and different types of approaches. And so that will become really important uh, when we think about, um, sorry, I lost my screen there for a minute, when we think about inclusive capability. Next screen, please. Thanks. And then finally, um, the thing that ties all of those, those three ingredients together is really the need to establish a national marine governance framework of some kind. Um, principles, perhaps, that um, guide the work um, that the, the other sets of ingredients are, are informed by. And ensuring marine governance that sustains ocean outcomes for future generations will really rely on a more holistic approach with a clear vision and objectives, as noted before. Um, in the short term, there are things that we can learn from. There are existing things in place, existing approaches that have shown um, you know, some evidence of success, um, things like te mana o te wai, um, where, uh, which is um, water-centric, um, and, and we in the challenge have talked about things like te mana o te moana, which is an ocean-centred way of, of thinking about governance, and that's, so that's really about um, prioritising the interests of the ocean first before the interests of people and the economy. Um, and so there are those existing notions that um, are being applied in different um, contexts and in different ways. But longer term, um, as longer term success and to achieve some of the things that we talk about in the in the guidance that we've put together around marine governance will really lie in legal and policy reforms over time. Um, to really maximise the benefit and the opportunity to come out of um, an aligned, cohesive and effective marine governance approach. Next slide, please, Karen, which I believe is the end. Kia ora. Kia ora koutoua. Thank you, Karen and Linda. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes now for any questions, so if you do have a burning question, please do pop that into the Q&A. Um, we'll give it a minute or so to see if any come through, otherwise we'll move on. Alrighty, well, if you do have a question, uh, just fire it through and we'll get to it after the next presentation. Uh, but otherwise, I will hand over to Liz McPherson to take over. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'm Liz and I'm here with Eric Jorgensen today to talk about our synthesis of 10 years of sustainable seas research about marine law and policy. And our focus today is on what we can do now to embed an ecosystem-based approach to marine management within our current policy settings. Um, a key point that Eric and I would like to make is that a lot of the directives are already there in our legal and policy frameworks, and they can be implemented now. So you've already heard from Karen and Linda about the fragmentation of our marine law and policy frameworks, and that's set out on the slide that, that the challenge has prepared. So we know that there are multiple laws and policies that apply to the coastal marine area. These are not always well aligned, and they may be working towards inconsistent purposes, or they might be driven by different or inconsistent values. These laws and policies apply to fixed spaces, um, as you can see on the slide, and they also apply to fixed timescales. But those spaces and timescales don't really reflect the way that nature or ecosystems function or the stresses that affect ecosystems, which don't like to respect um, lines 
drawn on maps. So that's a real challenge for law and policy. And as Karen explained, ecosystem-based management is an internationally recognised marine management approach. The objective of EBM is to improve marine ecosystem health and the health and well-being of related communities by integrating approaches across science, law, policy, and practice, um, across sectors and across scales. EBM is not just good science, it's actually already mandated under our legal and policy frameworks. We have synthesized the legal enablers for EBM across these frameworks. And we have a document that we've prepared, which will be uploaded shortly to the Sustainable Seas website, which um, summarizes and explains how those legal levers enable an EBM approach. That document will include references and explanations so that you can go away and look them up and use them um, in your policy work or your decision-making work. But the key point that I'd like to make here is that there is a smorgasbord of enablers for EBM across our legal and policy framework. So here's a summary of the enablers that we talk about in that document. And I wanna just point to a few examples um, from the international scale, for example, the United Nations has promoted integrated ocean management for more than 30 years. And there's an increasing convergence in international law around biodiversity conservation, climate change mitigation and adaptation and indigenous rights and particularly um, this convergence we're seeing through an ecosystem approach. You can see this in the global biodiversity framework, for example, which expressly adopts an ecosystem approach. And its goal A refers to a need to support the integrity, connectivity, and resilience of all ecosystems um, being maintained, enhanced, restor or restored, and substantially increasing the area of natural ecosystems by 2050. At the domestic scale, for example, the purpose of the RMA under sustainable management includes safeguarding the life supporting capacity of ecosystems. The Fisheries Act purposes refer to the needs of future generations. The Fisheries Act sets out environmental principles, including with respect to the biological diversity of the aquatic environment um, being maintained and habitats of particular significance for fisheries management being protected and the Fisheries Act requires a precautionary approach. The Marine and Coastal Area Takatai Moana Act enables the recognition of Māori customary title, and it actually enables a range of marine management and protection activities by iwi and hapu that we haven't really um, get to see the full effect of. And not to forget the Environment Act, that refers to a need to take full and balanced account of the intrinsic value of ecosystems alongside treaty rights and the rights of future generations. Coming down to policy, um, the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, what a fantastic document. Um, it includes multiple policies that align closely to an EBM approach. So does Te Mana o Te Taiao, Aotearoa New Zealand's biodiversity strategy. It seeks that ecosystems and species are protected, restored, resilient, and connected from mountaintops to ocean depths. Te Mana o Te Taia was referred to in the draft guidelines for habitats of particular significance for fisheries management, which recognises that Fisheries New Zealand are moving towards an EBM approach. And to Ohu Kaimoanas, Te Ha o Tangaroa Kia Ora Ai Taua, which means the breath of Tangaroa sustains us, is framed around an ongoing independent relationship between Māori and living Tangaroa. This emphasises reciprocal rights and obligations to care for the Moana for the benefit of future generations. And our courts have handed down a number of landmark decisions consistent with an EBM approach, um, and many of these you will be familiar with. Just out last month from the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, 2024 advisory opinion unanimously found that states, including Aotearoa New Zealand, have obligations under international law to reduce the impacts of climate change on marine areas, to apply an ecosystem approach to marine law and policy, to reduce marine pollution, and to support marine restoration based on best available science. 
So what did our Sustainable Seas research conclude about how to enable EBM within our legal and policy frameworks? Well, we found that ecosystem-based management can be implemented under existing laws and policies, but consistent with what Linda was saying, we need to agree on the vision and values guiding marine policy implementation. We need administrative arrangements that will support the implementation, and these need to be funded and resourced, and we must uphold to Te or Waitangi, our founding constitutional document. We looked at opportunities within Aotearoa New Zealand's legal frameworks for EBM, and this table summarises what we found. Um, many of these things are, have already started under sectoral rules, regulations, and governance arrangements, and Eric's going to talk about that a little bit more, um, and the pathways to ensuring the implementation of these things and the things that we need to do in terms of marine law reform. So I'll hand over to Eric now. Kia ora Liz, kia ora katou. Um, yep, so implementation pathways is something that we focused on and um, is available in the guidance documents that were produced by the challenge. We looked across three categories, um, high level policy objectives, arrangements, rules and regulations, uh, governance arrangements and enabling conditions and processes. And then we took that and put it across three timescales, as you do, um, short, medium and long term. And so I just want to go into a little of that over the next three slides. Thanks, Liz. Um, it's kind of front loaded. Uh, a lot of steps in the short term um, because we need to start working on it. Um, and, and, and much of this is around working with what we already have. And then we iterate and constantly improve our management and government pro governance processes. Um, so in the short term, it's about setting up the right administrative arrangements, again, with the adequate resourcing, um, and again, developing that shared vision for a marine policy. So it's around, if you like, building a foundation for future iterations. Um, and for us, we, we think the best way to achieve that um, is through the creation of a legal entity for the ocean um, and then creating those fundamental marine principles, which which we, different people use different language for, but the overriding set of principles that everything should give effect to. Um, and we can do a lot of that through more effectively and efficient, efficiently implementing laws and policies that we already have. Uh, and I know we keep saying that, but that's because it's, it's, it's real. Um, and a lot of this can be guided um, through recognition of Te Māori and collaboration across sectors um, in terms of implementing using our sectorial-based legislation and policy. Um, for example, through collaborative and cross-sector pl planning using uh, Q Takatai mounts to sea approaches, uh, adopting more thoroughly, um, consistently, if you like, multi-species fisheries plans, um, progressing the habitats of particular significance for fisheries management work and, and prioritising resolution of MACA claims. Um, so those are some of the things in the short term. In the medium term, thank you, Liz, um, is around locking down those gains and continuing management and governance process improvements. Um, and in the context of the established fundamental marine principles, um, I should add, along with things like the EBM principles that we've defined, the blue economy, blue economy principles that have been defined by the challenge and the Te Māori principles that have been defined, um, starting to review our existing marine policy and aligning that to the shared vision. Um, and then you can start to identify where you have key gaps against those visions in terms of existing marine policy and legislation. For instance, we might find that you can make improvements around marine protected areas reform, around climate adaptation and restoration, around non-climate related rehabilitation and restoration policy guidance. Um, and I guess one of the key points there is around acknowledging that must of our, much of our existing policy and legislation aims to deal with the potential for adverse effects um, and so if you're actually looking at rehabilitation and restoration, it's not necessarily fit for purpose in terms of assessing 
those types of activities. Um, but also looking at how we can um, harness the potential of ocean-based nature solutions. Um, for example, blue carbon. The second column, um, which is just is 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 in grey, to acknowledge that th those are the fundamental processes that we have to keep doing alongside all of this over all terms, um, and in the long term is about embedding ecosystem te ao Māori blue economy approaches whilst constantly reviewing and adapting to environmental, social, economic cir circumstances. I guess one of the key things that we haven't said today, but we've said between our two projects a lot in the past is that um, ecosystem-based management is an approach. It's not an end game. And, 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 and it creates a, a guiding framework, if you like, um, but it needs to constantly evolve. It, it, it's not an end game in and of itself. Um, and, and that's where we see the legal entity for the oceans can have a, a critical role um, in terms of helping to keep all agencies, decision-making bodies and others uh, moving forward. So if you can flick over, please, Liz. We came up with this diagram um, of potential marine administration arrangements on how, how that can work. Um, because we kind of thought, well, we've got all this stuff. We keep telling people that we can do so much with what's already in existence, but we're still not enabling EVM. So why isn't it happening? And and that's where in the in the last slide of Liz's, I think it was, you know, we talked about the enabling conditions and processes um, that's so critical to actually tying all this together. So while this diagram depicts potential administration administrative arrangements at a at a national level I, I think the key things in here that apply to any scale of decision making governance etc i know i shouldn't say etc um are actually the key functions of the entities in here um and the processes that tie those functions together and and those can all be put in place without necessarily having to create a legal entity for the ocean, for instance, or a mataranga hub, for instance. Those functions and processes don't have to be um, in policy and nationally directed and funded. We can actually start to do those things and have. Karen gave us some examples of where these things occur at smaller scales. We can start to do those things now. Um, we won't have necessarily the, therefore a uh, nationally consistent approach to these things. But this is where we can start to implement EBM now at, for example, regional scales. And I just want to touch on the Ocean Secretariat a little bit because that was a move in this direction, um, albeit ultimately not successful, one would argue, because it's a notion of, of it being an add-on to people's existing role and things that actually needed to be purposeful um, and resourced critically and it needed to be the job to create that consistency in terms of across the agencies in that instance interpretation of the different sectorial policies to get a better outcome overall um, those are things that we can do now um, yeah so when we start to look at the functions of the, the potential functions of these types of entities and the processes that tie them together, um, you know, it, it's kind of a starter for 10 um, to start to stimulate some some thought um, that you, you can perhaps pick up and run with. I get, um, overall, uh, as we move forward, the key caution is, is that no single agency, council, sector, ent entity, can move towards EBM on its own. You've got to do it with others. Um, and, and I think that's the key message. Pretty much ending up there. Thanks, Liz, if you can flick over. You can find the research we've shared with you today on the Sustainable Seas website by clicking, clicking on this link. Um, and, and that's the booklet that contains all of, all of our synthesis or integration for impact projects and the wrap up on it all. Um,
please do go and have a look. Um, it provides the detail behind not only today's slides, but then also the references and links to the empirical research that actually supports all of this. Because I we we didn't just sit in our offices and, and have some good ideas. Um, it, it really is grounded um, in research. And we've got a big slide. I'm not going to read out all the names. Um, and we've, we didn't even put all the names in. We've grouped some of you. Um, but a very genuine thank you on behalf of all of us, I think I can say, across our two projects um, for the support, discussions, um, yeah, ideas, banter at times, um, and just testing each other. Eh? It's been really, I, I've personally um, feel like I've learned a lot more than I've contributed um, and really enjoyed it. Thank you. Kia ora koroa. Thank you, Eric and Liz, for your presentation. Uh, we've got plenty of time now for some questions, so please do pop those into the Q&A. Nailed it. Must have been very thorough. <laughs> uh, maybe while we wait, does anyone have any comments on kind of how they see their research or recommendations evolving in the future? You know, if we maybe if we had another year of funding, what would you want to do? I just wanted to mention um, that I understand that the EDS are continuing with doing some work around oceans reform after um, the end of the challenge through their oceans project. So really looking forward to more attention um, being given to this issue by other researchers um, and advocates for ocean protection. Because, I yeah, we would just really hope that other people are going to carry on with this sort of research. I also wanted to quickly apologise to Matanuka Mahoika for misspelling his name on that last slide if anyone else picked it up. Oh, we've got a question from Tash. What do you think are the enabling factors needed to implement this kind of governance? I suppose we could quickly say money, but you go on, <laughs> Linda, governance is more your thing. <laughs> yeah, money money helps, um, but it, like I said in the um, presentation, it needs to be consistent um, resource because, um, you know, that enduring um, certainty is really important for um, governance that is able to plan long-term and is able to set long-term vision um, and address val people's values and um, and principles, which we know are long-term in nature. So it is actually critically important. Um, but uh, during the course of our observation across the challenge, the the ingredients that we highlight highlighted, um, there was no shortage of, um, and at multiple scales, you, you know, not just the local and regional, but at national level, of course, as well. And so I think it's just providing um, more of that environment within which that courageous leadership can flourish will be really important. Yeah, I would just um, echo what Linda said in the sense that the research does show that, that there is evidence of people who are leading, things that are, um, people are taking the bull by the horns in a way and doing things. But I, I would add to the money time these things take time and recognizing that they take time. And from, I guess, the perspective of, um, so particularly for those non-statutory place-based things that are led by by communities or by iwi hapu, um, when it, at the point of engaging with those other kinds of more formal entities like different government ages, agencies and councils, recognizing and respecting the time that these people are putting into these kinds of arrangements and resourcing that time, whether it's 
is I would say another con an enabling condition that needs to be supported or um, but that I think the real challenge is thinking about how do we move from a whole lot of bespoke almost um, place-based initiatives to something that is is more overarching and that's where a, you know both sets of research come back to the need for um, a national framework or some kind of guiding shared principles and yeah how we get there is another matter but time and money well thank you both uh, another question comes through in the chat from Shay do you think that there are too many entities required to collaborate to get an implementation phase or is it possible Right. Uh, yeah, good question, Shay. Um, I, I, I think there's too many to start at that place. Uh, I, I think you necessarily need to prioritise what your view would be on the most most important ones to start with. Um, I, I, I think you know, establishing those fundamental marine principles to go alongside the EBM principles, blue economy principles, Te Māori principles, um, is, is important as a first step because then you have an idea of what it is collectively you're trying to achieve. Um, and I think also it, it's it's not dissimilar to why you wouldn't just jump straight in and create a new oceans policy um, off the bat. You actually need to work with these things progressively to understand how they can fit together and... and um, if you bite off too big a chunk, you won't make any progress up front, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, ultimately, uh, there, are, there are ways of doing that organisationally, but you don't move from, from where we are today to that place in one step. It, it would need to be part of a very careful, carefully planned um, transition, which is why personally I'm, I'm bigger on transitions as opposed to transformation, even though the need for transformation gets closer, perhaps, daily. Additional thoughts, team? Um, excuse my COVID brain, but I was just thinking, I was in a me meeting recently where we talked about this kind of thing and in the sense of um, working across different agencies or different groups of people around something that needs to be done anyway. So, and working in that non-regulatory space. So if you're thinking about, um, I guess a problem focused way of dealing with an issue or dealing with something as, as, as a way of bringing people together to work on that thing. Um, that could potentially be a bit more targeted because there are lots of different organizations or agencies that could, like, I don't think you sort of say, oh, let's all collaborate and come together to do this one thing. It, it is more effective if you can organize like developing a, an action plan about, some kind of um, works to protect particular parts of an estuary or something like that, that can be an effective way of, of bringing different groups together that sort of makes, the, potentially makes the collaboration more efficient. But um, Eric has, seems to have thoughts on that. <laughs> sure, we want to dominate. I think, I think that that's partly a scale issue as well, eh? and it's part of the, the top down, bottom up. And 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 kind of how they support one another, as opposed to how they meet. In some ways, um, I, I do think, from my personal experience, you know, issues are really good ways to get people around the table. But if we stay in that space, we're only ever playing catch up, right? Um, so it's actually how do we make that transition to to front footing things. Um, I just wanted to add one thing too to Shay's question. Um, I, when we first started at, at the beginning of phase two, the research into law and policy for EBM, we were picking up on some suggestions by other scholars that we just needed one Oceans Act that would just include everything and one Oceans Agency that would just do everything. Um, and once you actually start to delve into the legal frameworks, and some of those are shown on that first spatial scale slide that we started with um, in the law presentation, 
is that there are so many and that doesn't even show all of the laws that apply um and they you can see how it would be very difficult to include all of that in one super piece of legislation you've got things like you know pohiri tauma around around um heritage and wahitapu and you've got rules and laws around shipping routes and ports and undersea cables and you've got aquaculture and you've got fisheries and you've got offshore wind and you can just see how it suddenly gets very very big um, and that's not even to take into account RMA so I think the temptation of thinking that we could simplify everything into one place when we're talking about the ocean is extremely difficult and when we looked around the world everywhere had the same situation that some degree of fragmentation would always exist but what's really important is having the administrative arrangements and processes that can integrate all the different actors who are working in the ocean space including across regional and central government but also in community and industry but ultimately for them to be guided by an overall vision um, that's a more holistic vision and that's a long-term vision as Linda says um, in order that people are working together and not at cross purposes. Great, thanks everyone. Um, David has asked about citizen involvement uh, and whether maybe some direction in that area could create its own energy and linkages. I suppose I could start with that. I mean, because we have, through the course of our projects, seen um, governance in action at different scales, um, citizen involvement is woven throughout them um, and it is often um, driven by issues as has just been discussed um, and you know we have a number of examples of that in the challenge but also driven by um, people's uh, particular commitment to, to, to values or to worldview and we have seen examples of that where um, we have uh, governance arrangements that have grown out of a local scale and then led to um, codification and law, um, bespoke law often. And you know, there are numerous examples of that, including um, Kaikota Marine Guardians and the like. So um, citizen involvement, critical. Um, and as Eric mentioned, um, particularly critical to driving that that bottom up um, change in thinking and approach and application of community, um, local and regional based aspiration and vision. 